Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today, kicking off another week with Marty Winkle, my co-producer. And we have done about 420, 920 episodes, excuse me, of Stay Curious in four years, born out of the pandemic. And the reason why we've been doing Stay Curious is to reach out to you to brag about and share with you artifacts and information about our wonderful American Space Museum, where for over 22 years, we've been preserving the birth of America's space age right here in Brevard County that we call where it all started, is delivery room, so to speak. And we appreciate all our friends out there that for years have been following us and enjoy our program. And here it is at the end of October, and we're gonna kick off a fundraiser in November to help our humble nonprofit get some of the things we need, like better equipment for our studio example. So you've all been giving and been out there and helping us, and we certainly do appreciate that. So today we've got a mixed bag of some great astronaut birthdays. we got some shuttle, uh, uh, two great shuttle missions, and we've got my notes sitting right over there, Marty, if you'd be so kind to hand them out to me right on that... Uh, Oh, right, yep, right there, sir. The whole back of look there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some moonshine out there at night. As some of you saw the full moon over the weekend and uh, Saturday, there was an eclipse in all over the world except North America. It was just a partial eclipse. And that's what this photo is all about. Is a uh, Who is this gentleman here? I got it wrote, wrote down here somewhere. In... Uh, 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 Paris, France, uh, took this picture outside of Paris, France, a jet going over in front of the moon as this is the Earth's shadow down here at the bottom. It wasn't a total lunar eclipse. It was just a partial one where part of the moon was uh, 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 launched in there. And uh, no, I'm going to need my shovel scroll here. So made a beautiful picture there. And you can see pictures like this on Space Weather dot com one of our my favorite websites and uh a week from saturday oh no wait a minute we got uh, out of sync there marty okay let's go let me go back uh -oh, we're going in fact let me go forward there we got out of sync yeah now there there's the front right there yep Tipped our hand there a little bit, but sorry we didn't have those racked up uh, to the beginning. A little bit of Stargazer at the end of this. Some Mondays we do nothing but Stargazer uh, stories about being a backyard astronomer. But there's so many two great missions that we want to talk about shuttle-wise and all these three birthdays. So we're going to talk about that today. Our space memorabilia show is Saturday, November 11th, Veterans Day from 9 to 3 at Beachside Hotel and Suites. Tables are $30 if you know someone wants to sell some space memorabilia. And we anticipate the vacationers and snowbirds to show up and down. Cocoa Beach, this is right on A1A, this hotel. So get you some Christmas gifts for that uh, that budding Artemis astronaut or on, on your list or one of us space geeks. We always love anything. We're putting together this autograph session on Thursday morning. November 16th with the uh, the director and producer of Searching for Skylab, America's Forgotten Triumph. Ellen Millie Carney of Space Hipsters is supposed to be here also as she was a consultant on this wonderful documentary that you can buy. Astronaut autographs are going to be $100 each for Jack Lausma and Rusty Schweiker. And if you get two multiple astro uh, two autographs from the same astronaut, it'll be $160. Now, these gentlemen are in their late 80s. They, frankly, are saying this will be it. Both of them are saying they will not, particularly Schweikert, does not want to participate in any more autograph sessions. This movie is supposed to be shown at Kennedy Space Center on the afternoon of November 16th. And we're efforting some of the details with that aren't completely put together. Must be in line by a quarter till 12 to get your uh, autographs of two Apollo veterans, Jack Schweikert, of course, 56 days on the Skylab space station, Rusty Schweikert uh, on Apollo 9, testing the lunar module, did a spacewalk, also experienced some space sickness. 
one of the first ones to really have to curtail some of his uh, ambitious uh, agenda being up there because he didn't feel well. Well, we're into the birthdays, Marty, and uh, feverishly writing something down there. Have I done something wrong? Oh, chat is disabled. Don't know why. Okay. All right. So sorry about that on our YouTube channel. If the chat is disabled, you can make comments down at the bottom, I believe, on there. Look at these three wonderful astronauts. You might know all three of them. Maybe you met all three of them. Who Gibson. Uh, happy 77th birthday to him, born in Cooperstown, New York. Ron Guerin, uh, born in 1961, that makes him 62 years old. Uh, born in Yonkers, New York, on October 30th. And Sandy Magnus is 59 years old, but don't tell her I told you so, okay. Uh, born in Belleville, in Illinois. And there's a, uh, a picture of them as astronauts, and then as they look today, uh, and you only need one picture of Hoot Gibson. He is definitely one of the iconic pilot commanders of the space shuttle era. I want to look up a fact here on my shuttle scroll here as I get it out here. Uh, old Hoot was um, looking for his first command uh, of Gibson. Would have been uh, 61C. Yep, that's what I thought. Five trips to space pilot one time and a commander four times we'll talk about hoot gibson what's his real name you know out there i know tom usiak knows what his real name is how did he get the nickname hoot is was he have a real good eyesight or what's that up about well let's tell you about that here in a second there he is he is also his last name's gibson so of course gibson guitars go with him and uh, happy 77th birthday. We'll bet he'll be flying his airplane today as he's a big uh, aviator. Uh, born in Cooperstown, New York, but considers Lakewood, California to be his hometown. He married Dr. Rhea Seddon in 1981. They have four children. She flew to space three times. Um, a surfer and a motorcycle rider. He's also the lead singer and guitarist for the astronaut band Max Q. Now, at age 77, I think 10 years ago, he was rocking it out a little bit uh, more than he might be now. Uh, his first flight, STS-41B in 1984, and then he commanded four shuttles, his last flight in 95. Uh, here's a little interview. There's a picture of him there with his wife, Rhea Seddon. Why is he wearing that Southwest Airlines shirt? Because he was a pilot for Southwest Airlines for over 10 years. Could you imagine flying the friendly skies with a man who was commander of four shuttles and pilot of another one? Now, that would have been awesome. Well, Gibson Guitar did an interview with Hoot Gibson. And their last question is, where did Hoot come from? And Hoot Gibson replied, I always tell people that it comes from, quote, not worth a hoot, unquote. You don't hear that very often, Marty. That phrase, not worth a hoot. <laughs> no, actually it didn't. He said there was an old cowboy movie star from the late 1930s named Hoot Gibson. He was a world champion cowboy in 1912 and died in the 60s. So after that, everybody whose name is Gibson usually picked up the name Hoot. My dad picked it up, and then I did. And when I got my first fighter squadron, if you saw Top Gun, the movie... You know that everybody has to have a call sign on the radio. That becomes your real name when that happens. So your call sign becomes your name. So I got Hoot. And Hoot Gibson says, most people don't even know my real name is Robert. So Bob, happy 77th birthday to you, one of the icons, shuttle commanders. Now a little bit more about, oh, I'm not going forward there, Marty. Something froze us up. Your jets on. Okay, we're froze up on our program here. He's, he's trying to fix the, uh, the chat. For a minute. Okay, Jessica's on background trying to fix the chat. So I'm not going to try to advance anything. Let's see, Hoot Gibson, 61C. That was the, uh, we were talking about that. Is that a shuttle of uh, uh, October where um, they did the spacewalk? No, that was, six, that was a, a different uh, line in there. 
uh, trying Trekkie Techies in the background trying to fix the chat for y'all on um, so uh, there so all right still can't advance it while she's there okay so uh, stalling a little bit more with Hoot Gibson I saw him this July out at the astronaut uh, Hall of Fame uh, at the Hilton uh, Hotel uh, with his wife and uh, she was being assisted a little bit with a cane there so i know she's also in her late 70s um scs 27 was the uh flight after uh, the second return to flight 20 first 25 26 and then 27 i think that, that was a dod mission 47 and then 71 for his mission so 71 G gibson went to um uh the Mir space station, I believe. So he had quite a quite a quite a great yeah. He was his fifth flight there, fourth as a commander. Uh, went uh, and uh, went up to with Charlie Precourt, the first Mir docking, who Gibson performed there. So there he is. Now we advance now to Ron Garin. Happy birthday to him. Sixty second birthday. Retired astronaut aquanaut. He's sixty two years old today. Eighteen days he spent on the bottom of the ocean. And 178 days in space on uh, two different missions. Uh, born in, like we said, Yonkers, New York. Uh, he was interviewed with Bart Martindale uh, there on our Stay Curious program. Substitute host, Bart substituted for me and did a great job of interviewing uh, Ron Garen when I was on vacation in September 16th, 2021. So Garen is a graduate up there of Embry-Henry College in uh, Daytona Beach area up there, as is uh, Nicole Stott. And uh, he participated in the last shuttle base spacewalk during STS-135 mission uh, when he was up on the space station then. So uh, he flew up the uh, and landed in the Soyuz. There he is there. What, what did you call this the school? The what? What did you call the school in Daytona? Uh, Embry Riddle. Oh, okay. I said Embry Henry, I'll bet. Because yeah, okay. there's an Embry Henry in Southwest Virginia. So I'm sorry, I said Embry Henry, and uh, it's Embry Riddle. Thank you, Marty. Aviation school up there, about $1,000 a credit hour. So uh, get your good grades when you're going up there, like Ron Guerin and Nicole Stott did. Well, there is the beautiful Sandy Magnus in a photo taken of her very recently. Uh, love the black and white photographer there. Uh, happy 59th birthday, born October 30th, 1964 in Belleville, Illinois. All right. Uh, she's got degrees at the University of Missouri Rolla, now, knows, now known as Missouri University of Science and Technology. She was selected in 1996 as the Group 16 astronauts known as the Sardines. Sardines were 44 astronauts, uh, the largest group selected. And here we honor Sandy up there in the upper right, next to Julie Payette, who Marty and I saw at different times, not together, out to Space Center this weekend. Uh, I'm going to go out there and see her tomorrow and get some final things autographed and tell her how much everybody enjoyed her out there. But that's just six of the astronauts on our um, 75 astronauts in our females in space gallery so shuttles of october featured a couple real goodies that we end the, the uh, month with sts 95 in 1998 uh, and launched on the october 29th date and then sts 61a in 1983 13 years earlier 61 was quite pioneering it was eight astronauts on the german d1 lab and of course 95 uh everybody knows you should know if you're a space geek was when john glenn took his second trip to space at age 88 years old eight, no, 78 77 hold off mark 77 years old let's talk about d1 first that was launched in 1985 <coughs> the west german science lab Mikey Haddad and Angel Otero, both level four payload specialists and the uh, for NASA, did a great program last Wednesday on this for us. So about the science of there. 
you've got Henry Hartsfield on the far right with the white hair was the commander. Steve Nagel was the pilot. Uh, and Steve Nagel's up there in the upper left beside Guy Bluford there, the African-American on his second flight. Uh, and we talked about Nagel's birthday was last week and he died of cancer way too young on there. Uh, the, the lady, of course, is Bonnie Dunbar. And then you got the scientist. So we said Guy, and Guy Bluford, there's the African-American on his second flight. Then you got Ernest Messerschmitt and uh, a German payload specialist uh, and Wubba uh, Ockels, the Dutch payload specialist. Uh, Wubba is on the far left there. And then you've got James Buckley is with the mustache. Uh, he's in the middle section there beside uh, Hartsville. So uh, I think you got three... Uh, uh, Hall of Fame astronauts in this group. It was the ninth and final flight of Space Shuttle Challenger before the fatal explosion three months later. Uh, it holds the current record for the largest crew, eight people of any single spacecraft for an entire period from launch to landing. Now they brought back eight people, uh, bringing back an extra passenger on the mirror, but it's the only one that launched eight and brought back eight. Uh, and wouldn't, wouldn't you know it, as I'm going the wrong way, Peach Fuzz, Krista McAuliffe was there to watch this launch. Of course, she lost her life three months later in the Challenger accident, which happened spookily about when this picture was taken of SCS 61C uh, going up. She was very thrilled to be there, 61A, I mean, uh, known as D1. Uh, she was the teacher in space and watched it from, uh, uh, and uh, was excited to know that she there would be another space flight in January, and then she was going. Uh, on uh, the late January fatal flight of Challenger. Here are the astronauts inside the D1 lab. A uh, very ambitious uh, uh, schedule there where they were, uh, and that's a, uh, on the floor there, you see the sled that they talked about on the show. They being Mikey Haddad and Angel Otero. Thank you for a great Stay Curious program. As we bring you space workers uh, uh, that did things that nobody else has ever done before in the show era. There's a beautiful launch that could be 61A, but it's not. That's STS-95 and our good buddy Tom Musiak using a Hasselblad con uh, uh, camera there with his team of his brother and a couple other friends, Steve Nolte uh, and I um, always forget the fourth guy, but it's uh, uh, Bob uh, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob. <laughs> I can't remember Bob's name. So, Marty, you, but anyway, awesome shot. That is a classic space shuttle shot. That is says it all right there. Uh, the power, the majesty, the liftoff. Good shot there, Tommy. Of course, John Glenn, the Mercury astronaut that orbited the Earth on February 20th, 1961. I am eight years old. My parents moved to Florida for one year in Winter Park. I woke up with the mumps and got to watch John Glenn go from the backyard with my mother in the backyard. And uh, I'm very star-crossed with John Glenn for, for, for many reasons. Here, uh, as with the UCF brothers are, here's Tommy's walkout shot of the crew going out there. Okay, uh, Brown, Kurt Brown is the uh, commander there. Uh, Mukai, uh, the Japanese lady there. Let me get my scroll out here because I because I can, and tell you that we've got. Um, uh, Lindsay was the uh, uh, pilot. He's he's there in the back. Perizinski, Robinson. I see Robinson's face there in the middle. Spacewalker, uh, and uh, uh, Duque, Mukai, and then of course Glenn on there. This was the twenty fifth flight of Discovery. Uh, and they took Space Hab up there. Space Hab is the same thing that Columbia took up, uh, not completely in the whole payload bay, sort of at the back end of it there. But uh, And we've done many stories about the STS-95 with different people that were there. And, you know, definitely Dan, uh, Kurt Brown had a chip on his shoulder that everyone forgot about his other crewmen there and how important they were thinking about John Glenn all the time. But why why wouldn't they not want to be thinking about John Glenn? Because uh, this was 1989, and then in 1999, uh, I mean, 
and 38 years earlier, he was on top of this uh, rocket that once had a nuclear weapon on it, the Atlas II rocket. And this is what I watched launch off in the backyard. And that was the only launch, Marty, I saw until I moved to Florida six years ago, though I tried to see a few shuttle launches that got scrubbed. And Mar Marty has seen every all these launches that he went to after uh, he saw Saturn V and so forth. So, well, I think that's neat. Here is the button that T.J. O'Malley pushed as a test conductor to launch John Glenn. Now, they erroneously say M.A. Uh, four on there or six uh, and that was corrected later where they say actually what does it say there the wrong mercury atlas numbers quoted on that but anyway that is the button that they put of course it wasn't on that that thing yes mercury atlas seven is it mercury atlas six uh tj o'malley one of the real uh, important figures of the uh apollo or, or the moon era uh, he was a man that uh, you didn't cross paths with without getting your job done right or you heard about it. And this button was in a console like we have here in the museum. And I know Lee Solid, the great rocket uh, scientist, said he went there to go dig it out himself and it was gone. We got this in a circuitous way, but it is ours. And we love having that in our museum and sharing with people. And here's a picture of John Glenn at a press conference in 1977 when he was senator for the state of Ohio, and I was a stringer photographer for the Associated Press, earned $30 that day photographing John Glenn at a press conference while I was putting myself through college at Ohio State University. And uh, I was at seven or eight conferences with John Glenn. I've talked about him before. I met the man personally. He sat down and ate hamburgers, Wendy's hamburgers with us, in fact. Uh, little did we know it was a test project at the time, uh, Governor Rhodes of Ohio was friends with Dave Thomas of Wendy's, and we ate Wendy's hamburgers and fries and malts with John Glenn at the state capitol. And all I can say is, every nice thing they say about this man is true. He was just an incredible person, and uh, not only commanded the room, but he he didn't big time you. He felt like you were part of the room too. And because uh, I told him, Mr. Glenn, you've heard thousands of times where people were when they saw your launch in 1961. And he snickered and said, well, more like hundreds of thousands of times. And I said, sir, I was eight years old and I woke up with the mumps and watched it in the backyard at Winter Park, Florida. And John Glenn said to me, Marty, it was better you than me woke up with the mumps. And I'll never forget that. That's the kind of guy he was. And don't tell the boss, but while I was photographing the collection, I got to wear John Glenn's hard hat just for just for a minute. And we've got pictures of him wearing this hat and holding it. So a uh, big story here is that this got jerked out of Hugh Harris's hands just about when John Glenn was going to autograph it because uh, 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 he got turned around and he never autographed it. And some people still... Uh, have a resentment about that, I'll say. But we've got the helmet. Who cares about his autograph on there? And at STS-95, the president, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton and his wife, Hillary, watched the launch. They were, uh, I think, the only sitting presidents to see a shuttle launch. Uh, some uh, retired presidents have seen the launches before. I was going to grab that exact date for this launch was uh, the 29th, yeah, 1998. I was saying 99, I aired in that. So uh, cool shot of our president and first lady watching the launch up there. And about when, after this had happened, well, there's John Glenn up in space a few days later, 77 years old. Yes, some older people like uh, uh, Bill Shatner uh, have gone to space that are older, but they had eight, they had maybe five to eight minutes of weightlessness on a Blue Origin launch. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Funk. Uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, Wally, yeah, Wally, Wally Funk. Funk. She was 88. I think she's. I think Shatner was older at 90 something, yeah. right? But they didn't stay up there for 10 days like John Glenn did. Okay, uh, so uh, give it to him up there. Maybe it's a seven day mission. Uh, so. Uh, and he come back and lived to a ripe old age of 95 years old, the last Mercury astronaut to die. Well, as Tom Musiak 
is taking this beautiful photograph of ascent to orbit. People on the pad were starting to scour around there because they watched the door for the parachute that is used for landing only to slow the shuttle down. They saw the door of the parachute fall off, all right? And uh, what does that look like? We just happen to have a parachute off of a shuttle door in our museum, all scuffed up because when our wheels are down, just before that front wheel comes down, or maybe right at that same time, the chute is ejected out by a pyrotechnics charge, and it slows the shuttle down from 200 miles an hour to maybe about 175 to save on those brakes a little bit, and then it releases. And the, the cover that tumbles down the road, uh, the, the road is scuffed up like this. Yes, Marty? Yeah, it, the door comes off, and the parachute comes out before the front wheel, before the nose wheel comes down. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was going to say it looked like it, uh, and watching that a bunch of times, STS-133 uh, come down. Uh, and you can see it bounce on the on the runway on most of the landing videos, okay? We've got one. Here's what it looks like from behind, okay? Of course, light as it can be. And that little, uh, that looks like a, a dryer vent. Those of you that know what your dryers look like in the house, where the vent goes out. Uh, and uh, that's where the pyrotechnic charge was. So thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Char uh, Chris. Thank you, Carlton Bailey, for giving me this next photograph here. Uh, Carlton went out to the landing of STS-95. He was also at the launch. I'll tell you his comments in a moment. But as you can see, Marty, there is the parachute is still in the tail at the bottom of the stabilizer right there. There, Marty, thank you. Yep. Right there's the parachute laying in there, and the technicians on the uh, the landing out there on a hoist checking it out, wanting to know. Now that had to be something. Of course, it's uh, it would be destroyed immediately if it came out, you know, during reentry and so forth. But isn't that something that that I wonder where that's at, and I wonder if they've got it, you know, appropriately displayed because we'd love that in our museum. That would be a cool item to have right there. So CB and Tom Usiak and other people I've talked to at this launch said it was a zoo. In fact, Carlton Bailey said that uh, at the press site between uh, where the, photo uh, the road and the famous clock, there were so many people packed almost elbow to elbow. It was like a mosh pit or a rock concert. He said you could have walked across everybody in there. And uh, and then uh, we talked to uh, uh, Connie McDaniel, our ace volunteer here, uh, who's a big boater out on Indian Lake. And she said that uh, she was out there on a boat on Indian River, Marty, and ha has yet to see that many boats ever on that river again. It was just jammed with everybody that had a boat was out there watching John Glenn go off, off to space again. And it was a successful mission, of course. And... Uh, we're all glad of that. So thank you, Carlton Bailey and Tom Usiak, partners of the America's Space Museum, for supplying their photographs from 1988 of one of the famous missions, not only of October, but the whole shuttle era, the day that John Glenn flew to space again, STS-95. Well, we'll reprise a little bit that we want to remind you that we have 13 humans orbiting the Earth right now. And... Uh, let me get my notes on this. 13 humans orbiting the Earth. And uh, we were talking last Friday about this. I want to emphasize again that the, uh, the uh, Shenzhou 16 crew of China is coming back. Probably uh, you'll hear about it tomorrow morning. Uh, probably in the middle of the night Chinese time. It'll be the 31st is when they're coming back. So we'll hope that that's all safe. Uh, but Marty, again... We do not have any American males orbiting the Earth. We want to emphasize that. We have six Chinese men. We have uh, Japanese Fuokawa. We have uh, Denmark's Morgensen on our space station. We've got three Russians, uh, okay. And we've got uh, two American women, uh, Jasmine Magoli and Laurel O'Hara. All right, so two Americans and their women. When was the last time that happened? But well, we've got to stay curious research department on that to come up with a, a answer here, hopefully by the end of the week. So uh, uh, 608 humans have orbited the Earth by our count. And thank you, Bill Harwood, for 
If he wants to correct me, I wish he would. He's the dean of space journalists, and we had a show with CBS Bill Harwood's uh, a couple of weeks ago, so you might check that out on YouTube. Seventy-five women have been to space. So, uh, Marty, I've been uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Ty, uh, Bob K Kapla. Uh, we're talking about six hundred and eight astronauts. Get to Bob Kapla. When told me, reminded me, when was the most people in space? How many people is the most people we've ever had orbiting the Earth at one time? Humans. Now, if you'd have told me in 1983 how many people will be orbiting the Earth 40 years later, I'd have said, hell, there'll be 50 and probably 10 people living on the moon, like Antarctica style. No, 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 no. We've never had more than 17. Thank you, Bob Capallo, for, t for sharing that with me. Bob's a retired rocket scientist and uh, on our Facebook page and Stay Curious. When Shinzao 17 was launched, uh, May 29th, 2023, that had three Takio knots on it. Well, at that time, there were three Takio knots on their Tangong space station. We had seven people on the International Space Station. We just had 11 because leaving it the day before was Axiom Space Crew number two that had Peggy Whitson, the most flown uh, female uh, of all. Uh, on there and uh, two Saudi Arabians and John Schaffner on there. So we had at that moment bef uh, before they landed at 11 o'clock the night of May 30th, 2023, we had 17 people orbiting the Earth. So I'll be keeping my eye on that. Thank you again, Bob Kopla, for pointing that out to me, the exact dates. So uh, our uh, research department was a little lagging on getting that back to us there. So... Uh, but we love keeping up with our astronauts, 608 human beings since the, uh, what did Hugh Harris say, Marty? Hugh all Harris, eternity. all eternity, yes. In all eternity, 608 astronauts have orbited the Earth. Uh, as we know, eternity is humans. Who knows if they're human beings 500,000 years ago? Uh, there certainly isn't a trace of them. Uh, that they would have come and gone, I'm saying. The oldest uh, humanoids we have found are about 30,000 years old. All right. Well, enough of the people orbiting the Earth. How about things that we have orbited and rocks that we brought back from them? Here are some rocks brought back by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft that uh, during a six-year mission went to an asteroid uh, Bennu, right here, less than a quarter mile across, all right, y'all that go to drag strips for NHRA and so forth, uh, it's, uh, that, that's the length of your drag strip right there, and it has so little gravity, Marty, that they actually think you could push the material away like balls in that kid's play, uh, room where they have all those balls in about two feet deep in there to play in. Think about that. Well, we sent Osiris Rex there. It had a big probe. It sucked up, brought up a bunch, and suck it up. It had an impactor, like a bullet that collected a bunch of stuff. And this is what's outside the case that they still can't get open. They stripped a couple screws on it, I was reading about, trying to open up the real case where the real goodies are. This is the leftovers that was came down on top of the, the, the case that landed uh, about a month ago now in the Utah desert. Well, one of these little rocks there, Marty, which are probably about the size of the tip of my pinky finger, are going to be at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. this Friday. And I hope people are standing in line to see a piece of an alien asteroid. Uh, it's so cool. Uh, of course, they've, they're, they're analyzing all of this dust and material first. They found water. They found hydrocarbons. Again, always finding the things for life in asteroids and comets. <clears throat> and there's Comet Bennu. I mean, these little boulders on the side, you could just go up there and just a little poof like that, and they fly off into space. The gravity is so low. Well, Marty posted on the our green screen here this beautiful picture of the eclipse taken by a gentleman in, in France, uh, a jetliner going over it, not, not uh, superimposed. These are the kind of photos that you see on spaceweather.com all the time and we're glad to share with everybody 
uh, trying to catch that guy's name and I didn't bring it over here with me. Uh, but that was happening and the moon was full moon on Saturday. Okay, that's 14 days old. Uh, early Saturday is Friday night, Saturday morning. Europe, it was really all Saturday night. So uh, to talk like an astronomer, how many days old is the moon today? All right. Well, if full moon was Friday night, Saturday, okay, you got Sunday, Monday. So yeah, the moon's 16 days old today. Closer to 16 and a half, if you will. Uh, but 14 is full moon and 16 days old is a couple days after 19 days old here on, on uh, Friday. It's going to be the gibbous stage. And then if you say the moon's 21 days old, where's it going to be, Marty? Well, you're, you're not sure it's going to be up there, he said. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to rise about midnight. All right, because it's going to be in the morning sky. All right. So. The seven-day-old moon is first quarter over here. The moon is a 28-day cycle. So, yeah, every seven days is a quarter of that, that phase. So, seven days is first quarter. 14 is full moon. 21 is third quarter. And 28 days is new moon, which you're not going to see. So, now you're talking like an amateur astronomer. So, if I said the moon's 15 days old, uh, uh can I get some dark skies before I go to bed and see the Andromeda galaxy? Yeah, because at 14 days old, the moon's not going to rise till way after sunset. At full phase, it rises at sunset. So keep that in mind. One other little spacey thing to keep in mind here on Stay Curious today is the U.S. Postal Service issued these two special delivery stamps based on iconic images from the Webb Telescope. That would be the Pillars of Creation that uh, the Hubble made very famous. And uh, uh, my boss, Karen Conklin, previewing our show today like she always does to make sure I don't slip anything in there that I shouldn't, uh, said that looks like a praying mantis. And yeah, it does look like a praying mantis or a weird or maybe Godzilla. Hmm, Charlton Bailey, I can see little Godzilla in that face. Uh, the Cosmic cliff behind me here and not after cliff watson who is our buddy down in pomona australia good to see you mate but there's a 28 dollar and 75 cent stamp for special delivery that shows this iconic beautiful image of our web telescope named after the great nasa director well marty thank you for a good job there we didn't have uh, any comments at all going on so he didn't get the names of all of you watching there so we'll effort that and see why that didn't happen today but uh, we want to remind everybody that tomorrow is october 31st and it is halloween and so get ready for the american space museum starry starry astronomy night as i present to you scary astronomy and superstitions all right talk a little bit about why astronomy why halloween is an astronomical holiday it really is and the proof is in our show tomorrow. So come back and stay curious with us tomorrow. Marty, thanks for a smooth Streamlabs job there. We'll find out why we couldn't see your comments on YouTube, but you can post other comments there uh, at the base of there. And you can also send us money by clicking the three dots there and the uh, dollar sign thank button there, since many of you have. So... Until tomorrow when we talk about everything spooky in the sky, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.